From the food we eat, the air we breathe, the land we dwell, to the health of our body and mind, and the well-being of all things in the universe. Unlock the science with Chula Radio Plus. Welcome to Unlock the Science. I'm Virada Salim. Imagine you are born into this world and have just experienced little of what life has to offer, only to be informed later that you are afflicted with a life-limiting disease and would unlikely live into adulthood. It is a disturbing scenario, isn't it? Yet, this is the reality faced by many children who unfortunately suffer from the so-called life-limiting conditions. Life-limiting conditions are a general term referring to incurable and fatal diseases, according to National Institute for Health and Care Excellence, part of Department of Health and Social Care in London, United Kingdom. There are currently over 300 life-limiting conditions threatening humans. These conditions are categorized into four main groups. First, there are life-threatening diseases to which cure is available but is unlikely to be successful. Second comes conditions causing premature deaths. The last two categories are progressive conditions which can only be treated through pain relief and diseases that are irreversible but non-progressive that result in acute disability. Children who are diagnosed with life-limiting diseases have their life expectancy shortened. While some live for years and decades, others pass away within weeks or months after their birth. As the conditions are wide-ranging, there is no common trajectory in which they will develop. It has been pointed out in established medical journals that disease development of children diagnosed with the same illness is not necessarily the same. According to a research conducted by Martin House Research Centre, University of York in the UK, the number of children with life-limiting conditions in the UK increased by nearly three times between 2001 and 2018. The most vulnerable group was infants aged under one year old. Martin House Research Centre studies the care and support for children with terminal illness, their family members and medical workforce that look after these children. The upward trend in the number of life-limited children can now be observed around the world thanks to advances in medical technology which helps prolonging their lives. Children suffering from terminal conditions have complex medical needs and require thorough support. This is where pediatric palliative care comes into play. World Health Organization, or WHO, defines palliative care as an approach that improves the quality of life of patients, both adults and children, and their families who are facing problems associated with life-threatening illness. The service can be provided at hospital, community health centers, or patients' homes. In 2014, WHO announced the first global resolution on palliative care to improve access to this treatment as a core component of health systems. Thailand has adopted the resolution since. Professionals from different disciplines are involved in providing this kind of care and support. A team often comprises of doctors, nurses, therapists, psychosocial personnel, and social workers, to name but a few. They act in coordination and consult with one another to cater to individual needs of their young patients. According to the Global Atlas of Palliative Care, the number of children aged 0 to 19 years old in need of palliative care recorded nearly 4 million globally in 2017. A large majority of them lived in a low- and middle-income countries in Africa and Southeast Asia. The major conditions resulting in children's reliance on palliative care were reported to be HIV, the virus that damages our body's immune system, premature birth, birth trauma, and birth defects. To help us understand more about pediatric palliative care 
and children with life-limiting conditions. Unlock the Science reporter Hao Wang Meng talks to Professor Dr. Isorang Nutprayun, an expert in pediatrics at Faculty of Medicine, Jualangon University. Having been dealing with life-limited children since 2005, he is a pioneer of palliative care service at home in Thailand. Furthermore, he is the vice president of Thai Palliative Care Society and the founder of Wishing Well Foundation, which aims to fulfill wishes for children suffering from cancer. Professor Isarang, could you share with me and the audience of the expression and feelings that parents have when they are informed that their children have life-limiting conditions and may pass away soon? Yes, the uh, parents often feel shocked. Um, usually, they will, um, you know, they will try to um, try to see the options if there's some some ways that uh, the children can be treated so that they can prolong their lives. However, we, we uh, communicate straightforwardly. I found that most of the parents uh, would, would not choose, you know, do not choose to believe that they would allow the children to die. So there was some, some technique uh, that will uh, make this process easier. Uh, what are those techniques? First, ask about the child's life and see what's the meaningful Uh, life for them and, and if you're to doing to do this we can uh, we can know get to know the child better and then we can discuss with the parents and how the, the disease affects their you know the their children's life and whether or not allowing the children to live a full full life is the better option for the children and um, say example in trying to treat the cancer by going to uh, the hospital often. That's not what children wanted to do. But if you take the child to the beach, that's definitely something the child wanted to do. And we ask and ask the parents, you know, which scenario is better for the child? We already know the answer. It's to take them to the beach. And we said, you know, if the child wants to go to the beach, we can support you in that. And, and by doing so, the, the child and the parents you know, can live uh, you know, what the, the life that the children want. And then, then we can come back and discuss the next best option would be. And eventually, they will be, buy into the quality of life options. For the families of life-limited children, they might choose to either let the children live longer with the existence of medical devices or let them pass away early to prevent suffering. How do medical professionals help these families decide? You ask them critical questions like, you, you think the child, your child would want to live longer with this medical device? Is that how he wanted to be? He can say, you see, um, asking the parents decide what, the children might say it's a different way of questioning and many children, many parents would say no i think he would be suffering too much with this you know these options these medical treatment options therefore that means that they want to the care for their children concern about their quality of lives and they will give up the chance of living longer for sake of better quality of life for a short time. Many parents will, will choose these options because they don't want the child to suffer. But we have to put the questions this way. Otherwise, this, this thing is not going to show up in the conversation. Which option do Thai parents tend to choose? Um, very good question. Because it depends on the experience. To see most of the, most of the parents, the child was just born, you know? And the doctor said, no, this is condition is they cannot live, right? They said, no, doctor, we will do everything. Yeah, he cannot die now, right? Uh, so the child have to, you know, because the child was just born, he cannot say, right? And the parents will say, no, we have to do everything. I cannot let him die. And the doctors, we have means to do that. In fact, we have a lot of things we can do. And then as time goes on, The parents always have a hope that miracle will happen 
The doctor said this is not here, but I think he will be here. This is how they think. Yeah? And then as one year passed, two years passed, three years passed, he's not doing better, right? Even with the, the best thing they have, they have done for the child, the best thing that the doctors have done to the child. Now they just start to realize, I think the doctor is right. And he's, he's been uh, getting all of this and not better. And indeed, you start to see that, start to notice that he suffers anytime he comes to the hospital in order to fix things you know, that is, we, we think is treatable in order to live, make him live longer. But uh, each time he comes to the hospital, he suffers. Now the parents will change their mind at some point. The, the, the timing is very different. Making children accept the fact that they would pass away in the foreseeable future is daunting. How does pediatric palliative care carry out this task? Right, um, I would have to say that I will explain to people who have this question that in fact, the children doesn't really care about the, how much they are gonna live. They don't care whether they're gonna die because all they're interested in the present is the present moment. Am I allowed to eat ice cream? Am I allowed to go out and play with the other children? That's the only thing they care about at every moment, right? So they're not to, we, we do not have a mission uh, to, to tell the children, yes, you are going to die. No, that's not what we need to do. You shouldn't already know when the time comes. Yeah? And then their interest was how to live happily. We, we just decide to allow it or not. We allow it, that means we are providing palliative care. If not, if they live long life, then that's not, not their interest. That's the interest of the parents, right? So in this way, um, the, the answer to this is not to, not to worry about it. Focus on how to let them live happily every moment. That is Unlock the Science reporter Hao Wang Meng talks to Professor Dr. Isorang Nut Prayun of Faculty of Medicine, Jualongon University. We will take a short break now. You are listening to Unlock the Science on Chula Radio Plus. In order to deliver health benefits and improve patients' quality of life, music therapy has been applied in the field of palliative care for decades. Patients do not have to be knowledgeable about music to engage in therapeutic activities, which include listening to music, singing, playing instruments, composing a song, and using music technology. What you have just listened to is a piano improvisation that a music therapist plays when treating a child with mental illness. Through improvising, the therapist interprets information that the child conveys using white keys on the piano. Based on that, the therapist then creates a composition exclusively for his patient. For those who are too weak to move, music therapists will sing or hum to children using the situation that they are in as context. This helps children resonate with the music. Benefits of music therapy in palliative care have been noted in both quantitative and qualitative studies. One prominent finding published in Journal of Pain and Symptom Management in 2013 wrote that patients who engaged in music therapy sessions experienced significantly less pain than those who did not. Also, music therapy has proved useful for facilitating patients' emotional expression, building confidence, as well as preparing patients and their families for the departure of their loved ones. Last but not least, music therapy helps to serve educational needs of children. 
for those who have to be away from school because of their terminal conditions. Taking part in music-related activities could maintain such skills as attention, memory, decision making, and problem solving. Joining an interview with Unlock the Science reporter Hao Wang Meng is Professor Yos De Becker, coordinator of bachelor and master training in music therapy at Luga School of Arts KU Louvre in Belgium. He also heads the music therapy department at the University Psychiatric Center, and has edited three books about clinical applications of music therapy used in training programs around the world. Professor De Becker is an invited lecturer for the Master of Arts in Music Therapy program at Faculty of Fine and Applied Arts, Jalalongkorn University. In the process of creating a piece of music for children with life-limiting conditions, how could music therapists make sure that such music is able to relieve children of their suffering? Yeah, this is a very interesting question. Uh, the music we create with the child must come always from the child. Um, a child is n- not in the possibility to create compositions or songs, but in the play we do with the children, we got some musical elements from it, and it is the task of the therapist. To, uh, to take all these musical elements and to transform them in a song or in a composition or in, in some piece of music where the child can recognize himself in the music. Could you please uh, specify the music elements you are referring to? Yeah. Uh, so the, the musical elements can be from Uh, the verbal part, when uh, the the patient um, uh, or the child is uh, talking about something, the tempo, he is talking very fast or slow, or he has a high pitch or lower pitch, Um, the the, the color of, of his voice is also a very important element, the timbre, Uh, and there we take everything together. So the child can play together with the therapist and we see uh, regularly when we singing or playing music for them, the child reacts in breathing or moving their arms or smiling or have even crying because when you are really touched by the music on an, on an emotional level, the, the child can be so overwhelmed in a positive way that he starts to cry. Because it's really touching the child. Would music therapy be applied as soon as a child is diagnosed with a terminal disease? Yes, yes, especially. Uh, when there is a diagnosis, um, immediately a non-verbal therapist should be contacted. Um, because a child normally communicates by playing, by his body, by his movement. It's all non-verbal. And music really can reach immediately the, the um, the embodied um, level of the child. In music, we don't need words. We don't need to understand. Uh, The music goes directly into the psyche, into the emotion, into the body of the child. There are currently over 300 life-limiting conditions recorded around the world. Uh, Is it possible for music therapy to be applied to all conditions or the current music therapy specifically caters to certain diseases? Yes, I can be very short. Um, music therapy is never uh, a contraindication. Music therapy can be for, for everything. Of course, the music therapist has the knowledge and the expertise 
to 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 use the, the right interventions, musical interventions, the the the, the, the correct method, and so on. The, there is still going a lot of research about it, but there is no contraindication. What are the current barriers to the use of music therapy as part of pediatric palliative care in developing countries like Thailand? The first problem is regarding to Europe, we have 7,500 music therapists. Uh, here, maybe 10, maybe. So this is really a good start to have at least a training course on an academic level, doing also research. The second problem is you need specific equipment uh, rooms in the clinic where you can bring uh, the, the, the child to it, or you should have uh, qualitative high or uh, very good instruments. And, and, and it costs money. So for the clinics and the palliative care center, they should invest in music therapies and instruments. I am aware that besides leaving children of their suffering, music therapy helps families and friends cope with loss and grief after the children pass away. In what way could such an undertaking be achieved? Yeah, this is uh, of course an important uh, question because the loss is one of the most traumatic experience uh, um, for the family when young children are dying. This is not normal. Mm -hmm. um, this is really a traumatic experience and music has the possibility and only music, maybe also movement, but trauma has no form. Music, when you make some specific music for them, uh, which are in memory of the child, they can give it form. And when you give form to your trauma, to your traumatic experience, you can look to the trauma and you can make a distance and you are then at this moment not traumatized anymore. You can start to, to digest, to, uh, um, to make a goodbye to the child um, in a good way. A very interesting experience we had. There was a program at the Belgium uh, television and the interviewer asked the mother how can you tell us who was your daughter, your, your child? Can, can you tell it? And the mother said, wait. And she went to the recorder, the audio recorder, and she played the improvisation. And said, this is my daughter. And for all the listeners, it was really a very nice improvisation. But we could feel immediately how the daughter was. So it is a way to say goodbye, but keep the memory. Both our guests told us that palliative care focuses on supporting the here and now moment of children and their families rather than the future. However, Professor Isarang raises the issue of children's lack of access to palliative care in Thailand as their medical practitioners are not fully aware of this comprehensive service. In addition, communication between pediatricians and parents related to the importance of quality of life must be carried out in the right way so that they will opt for the service. Professor De Becker shared that Thailand's rich culture and open-minded students allow unique improvisation to be created. This very first music therapy program at Chulalongkorn University presents a good opportunity for the country to develop its future human resources in the field. 
Unlock the Science would like to thank Professor Dr. Isora n u t p r a y u n of Faculty of Medicine, j u l a l o n g o n University, and Professor Yos De Becker, Coordinator of the Bachelor and Master Training in Music Therapy at Luga School of Arts, KU Luva in Belgium, and an invited lecturer at Faculty of Fine and Applied Arts, j u l a l o n g o n University. I hope you enjoy our program. You can listen to Unlock the Science on Jula Radio Plus at FM 101.5 every Saturday from 1 p.m. to 1:30 p.m. You can also listen and follow us on our website curadio.jula.ac.th and our Facebook page. Our program is also available as podcasts, including on Apple and Spotify. See you again next Saturday. Have a nice day. Unlock the Science is edited and produced by Sinfa t u n s o r a w u d 